So it's a great pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, Ferenc Krauss. Ferenc is born in Hungary and is now a citizen of Hungary and Austri Austria. He got his MS in electrical engineering in Budapest and in PhD in Vienna in 1991, his habilitation in 1993. Actually, it was in 1993 that I met him first, and from then on, I've known him ever since. He joined the electrical engineering department as an associate professor in 1998 and a full professor in 1999. Um, that was in the Technical University of Vienna again. In 2003, he was appointed director of the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics in Garking, Germany. And in 2004, he was also a professor and chair of experimental physics at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. Uh, his research, well, I don't think it makes sense for me to tell you about his research because he's going to talk about it right now. But suffice it to say that it's in at a second uh, photonics and, uh, well, you'll hear about it now. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you for your kind introduction. Can you hear me? Is it okay? Yeah, okay. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure and honor for me to be here and be allowed to uh, give a lecture in this uh, renowned symposium. Uh, it is a particular pleasure and honor for me to uh, be on the stage uh, in a session chaired by Paul, who inspired me and influenced my work like, like no one else. Um, in my talk, I'm going to address uh, latest advances in ultrafast uh, laser technology, which uh, now um, provide for the first time in the history of science uh, direct access to uh, picometer at second scale electronic motions in all forts, forms of matter, as, as, as you know, uh, these electronic motions are ubiquitous, uh, not just in physics, but uh, way beyond the borders of physics in, in modern technologies, but also in life sciences, uh, chemistry, and biology. Uh, they did not quite, the applications did not quite reach out into social sciences yet, but we are working on that. Um, the work um, I'm going to present uh, has been done uh, at the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics uh, and uh, the chair of um, experimental physics uh, of the Ludwig Maximilian University, both situated um, in the uh, Garching uh, campus of Munich, uh, in the north of Munich, uh, about halfway between downtown Munich and uh, Munich airport. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the work uh, that I'm going to present has not been done by myself, but a great number of uh, fantastic uh, co-workers as well as collaborators, whom I very gratefully acknowledge, whose contributions I, I very gratefully acknowledge here. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to name all of them, but I will name a few of them in the context uh, of uh, specific experiments. I would also like to thank uh, uh, Christian Hackenberger and uh, uh, Woogie Works Animation Studio for uh, the graphics and animations in my talk. Uh, what you see here is how the electric field of a few cycle uh, laser pulse suppresses the Coulomb uh, uh, potential uh, binding uh, the electron of the hydrogen atom uh, to the nucleus uh, and uh, allow this electron to tunnel uh, through this narrowed barrier. Direct access to um, the electronic structure of matter in uh, space and uh, its, to its dynamic, uh, fastest dynamic changes in time, here re represented by optical field induced tunnel ionization, requires uh, a, a resolution of uh, about 10 to the minus 8 centimeters and 10 to the minus 16 seconds. Correspondingly, um, the, um, if, we, if we wish to make uh, these atomic scale uh, electron motions accessible to human observation, we, we need to create a device, we need to create uh, tools uh, that are capable of providing us with a temporal magnification of about 10 to the 16, which is uh, about the square of the magnification we need to make atomic structures perceivable in space. 
Etosecond technology furnishes us with this tremendous magnifying power, as well as more and more also with the capability uh, of controlling uh, these motions uh, on uh, their natural time scales. So um, um, I will start uh, my talk with uh, just very briefly reviewing uh, uh, the basic tools and techniques. This is going to be a kind of warm-up for, for many of you, so I apologize to all those for whom this, this is rather trivial. Uh, so please consider this just as a warm-up for the rest of the talk. Then I'm going to address a few of the latest applications which center on uh, electron phenomena in solids. And in the final part of my talk, I will discuss a little bit, if time, is left for that a uh, little bit the future of attosecond technology, which has actually already started. So attosecond uh, methodology and control are intertwined, uh, both uh, requiring a force that is uh, um, that is uh, variable in a controlled fashion on the relevant time scale. The relevant time scale is the natural time scale of electronic motion. Uh, this is the attosecond time scale. So the electric force of light is uh, uh, obviously capable of providing us with this force, but only if, uh, if uh, its temporal evolution is well controlled. So what we need uh, for this uh, is obviously a, uh, uh, what we need uh, for, for so providing this force is, is a, a, a laser pulse with a controlled temporal evolution of its electric field. Such laser pulses have become available um, quite some time ago, back in 2003, and opened the door to both controlling and measuring electron processes on, on the natural time scale. Um, I guess one of the, one of the uh, most uh, um, spectacular consequences of this newly emerged uh, technical capability has been the generation and measurement of isolated attosecond pulses. Um, my apologies go to all those in the audience who have seen this uh, movie already, this small animation already, but uh, at least uh, the music should also be new to them, so please just enjoy the music. Um, so, by the way, it comes from Hungary. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, green cloud here represents uh, the most weakly bound uh, uh, electron of um, uh, the atoms we expose to a few cycle laser pulse. And as you see here, uh, at the crest of the first intense half cycle, obviously the electric field becomes strong enough to detach this most weakly bound electron from its atomic binding with uh, some probability. Of course, it goes, if the electric field points, electric field points downwards, it goes upwards because uh, of this uh, awkward uh, uh, convention of, of the negative charge of the electron. Um, and uh, this process uh, uh, happens uh, due to uh, uh, tunneling ionization. The strong field suppresses the Coulomb barrier, as we just uh, discussed at the beginning of the talk and uh, the electron can tunnel through this barrier, barrier with, with, with some probability. So then in the first moment after this ionization, the electron continues its way. It's, it's, uh, it's pulled away uh, from uh, the atom because the, the field still points in the same direction. But uh, a little bit later at this point, the field trans uh, reverses its direction, pulls the electron back and this uh, this uh, uh, freely propagating wave packet uh, can interfere with the bound state portion of the very same electron. And uh, this interference uh, creates uh, a tiny atomic antenna, as you see it here. This is actually the result of a, of a quantum mechanical simulation. Here you see back and forth in time how propagation of this uh, uh, quasi-free electron wave packet uh, across uh, the bound state portion of the, of the wave function of the electron uh, uh, results in interference between the two portions and this interference makes the overall wave function oscillating up and down, forming a tiny atomic dipole and this atomic dipole is, is radiating and that's 
what resides in, in, in this short burst of high frequency light. Um, this uh, simple uh, semi-classical picture was uh, put forward uh, a bit more than 20 years ago by uh, Paul Corkum in a paper which has been cited, uh, I guess, more than 3,000 times meanwhile, um, and uh, forms the basis uh, of, of an extremely powerful semi-classical theory for the description of this process, for the description of, of uh, at a second uh, pulse generation. Uh, in a, um, a quantum electrodynamical framework, we might also argue that, that the electron that uh, uh, has been extracted from the atom uh, absorbs a large number of photons from the strong driving field and upon recombining back into its original ground state emits all this energy in, in a single photon. So basically the process converts many small energy photons from the driving radiation into one single high energy photon. Um, uh, and obviously this uh, high energy photon is equal to the sum of uh, the energies of the individual, um, of the large number of, of uh, low energy photons. So basically uh, what we have here is a kind of high order harmonic generation. So that's why, why the process has also been dubbed uh, this way. Uh, the process uh, um, um, takes place uh, simultaneously in um, uh, many atoms at the same time, given that uh, we, we have here a spatially coherent uh, laser pulse that, uh, that drives the atoms in the same way. So they, they radiate coherently and uh, the coherent addition of, of all these uh, tiny emissions uh, lead to a uh, substantial, uh, um, uh, to, to a attosecond or, or very short extreme ultraviolet light uh, with, with, with substantial energy. It propagates collinearly uh, with the uh, generating laser beam. Both beams um, come into a second uh, vacuum chamber. They hit a, a two-component mirror there, the internal part of which uh, reflects uh, the XUV pulse, the external one, the, the laser pulse, and uh, the two pulses can be delayed uh, with, with respect to each other with nanometer precision. That's what uh, translates into at a second uh, timing precision uh, in the time domain. And that's how uh, the one pulse is basically con the delay of the or timing of one is, is uh, controlled with at a second precision with respect to the other one. So uh, this is the basic apparatus that uh, we can uh, then use uh, for at a second uh, uh, control and spectroscopy experiments. And I will show you a few examples. Uh, somewhat later, but before that I would like to show you how we can use this apparatus for actually characterizing these two important tools for at a second science, the waveform controlled few cycle laser pulse and the um, uh, hopefully at a second extreme ultraviolet pulse, which of course we need to measure before we can really confirm that uh, the duration of this pulse is uh, uh, really in the attosecond range. So to this end, we expose a, um, an ensemble of, uh, again, neon atoms uh, to, to this sh ultra short XUV pulse in the presence of uh, the few cycle laser field that was previously used for, for its generation. So thanks to this fact, the two are perfectly synchronized to each other. This is extremely important. And uh, since uh, this strong field is present, the photoelectrons kicked off by the XUV pulse can be decelerated or accelerated by this laser field depending on their moment of release. And uh, due to this deceleration and acceleration, uh, they pick up a momentum. Uh, the momentum is changed uh, uh, by an amount that is simply given by the integral of Newton's equation. And this integral yields uh, the vector potential at the instant uh, t, and this instant t uh, indicates the uh, release moment uh, of the uh, photoelectron. So basically this connects the, the, um, the momentum change with the instant of release. Um, uh, as we see here, um, uh, monotoni uh, monotonically, uh, basically um, unambiguously and monotonically uh, and, and th this way maps the 
temporal profile of um, a sufficiently short XUV pulse, short enough to be within this half cycle of the laser pulse, where this connection between delta P and uh, the time is monotonic. And this monotonic connection maps uh, the temporal profile of the XUV pulse to a corresponding uh, energy or momentum distribution of the uh, uh, photoelectrons that have been released in this process. Uh, we can also refer to this as the streak image of this, uh, of this um, uh, XUV intensity profile um, uh, because the, the, the method is uh, uh, in close analogy to um, uh, microwave uh, uh, streak cameras where a microwave field deflects uh, basically uh, photoelectrons released by uh, femtosecond, picosecond laser pulses. Uh, the concept again was uh, 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 pioneered uh, first proposed by, by Paul and he also played a very important role in the first experiments that we uh, performed in Vienna. Uh, if the pulse, the XUV pulse is short enough, uh, significantly shorter than this half cycle, then uh, the, the streak image uh, uh, of the XUV pulse is hardly broadened. Instead, it's uh, shifted up and down as the XUV pulse is scanned across the a uh, few cycle laser pulse. Um, and uh, this uh, set of, uh, of uh, uh, streaked photoelectron spectra as a function of delay uh, provides uh, full information about both the evolution of the few cycle laser pulse as well as about the, about the um, temporal uh, uh, profile intensity profile as well as chirp of the attosecond uh, XUV pulse. So basically by a technique uh, or by the very similar uh, approach uh, we are using in frequency resolved optical gating, we can also retrieve from such a um, attosecond streaking spectrogram both the temporal evolution of the few cycle laser pulse as well as the temporal profile and chirp of the attosecond XUV pulse down to Meanwhile, 80 and uh, more recently even 70 attoseconds. So just to sum up this part from our capability of controlling the electric force of light and synchronizing processes under scrutiny to this force, uh, uh, both with attosecond precision, uh, basically the capability of performing uh, measurements on the attosecond time scale arises. And, and uh, I would like to show you a few examples for how this is working, for how uh, we can actually use these attosecond tools um, um, for capturing as well as controlling electron processes. Uh, well, attosecond uh, uh, resolution is required uh, for real-time insight into, into a truly vast variety of uh, uh, electron phenomena in, in solids. Uh, uh, including um, ones uh, that are particularly relevant to advancing electronics, uh, uh, to pushing the frontiers of electronics and eventually advancing it to its ultimate limits, such as, for instance, uh, atomic scale charge transport or optical field induced changes of electronic processes. So we first uh, address the question whether um, atomic scale electron transport can possibly be uh, captured in solids and uh, I wouldn't have asked this question if, I, if, the, if the answer wouldn't be affirmative. affirmative. Um, uh, indeed, uh, attosecond streaking uh, uh, turns out to be ideally suited uh, for capturing um, electron transport in solids. Uh, um, uh, what, we, what we need to do is to shine in an attosecond uh, XUV pulse that uh, um, uh, kicks off uh, electrons, releases electrons uh, from quantum states of different uh, binding uh, energy. And uh, these electrons propagate, uh, obviously propagate with different speed uh, and consequently reach uh, the surface at uh, different instants um, from within their escape depth, which uh, are, are denoted by D2 and uh, D1 here. And that's the simple formula that determines this uh, uh, propagation delay difference. And uh, now all we have to do is just to shine in a, a few cycle laser pulse on the surface 
and uh, use this for actually uh, recording a streaking spectrogram of both electrons. And this, uh, this propagation delay or arrival time difference on the surface uh, directly translates or, or manifests itself in um, a uh, temporal shift uh, between the uh, attosecond streaking spectrograms simultaneously recorded for the low energy and the high energy electron. This experiment uh, was performed by um, Andreas Baltuszka and, and Andreas, Andrea Cavalieri back in 2007. Meanwhile, um, um, quite a few follow-up uh, studies have been um, performed in a much improved apparatus uh, 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 under the leadership of uh, Reinhard Kimberger. And uh, um, these follow-up studies uh, have uh, brought to light uh, a very strong dependence of propagation delays on both material choice, system choice, as well as, uh, as, well as uh, the excitation photon energy, which uh, have been varied here by merely 15 electron volts, so by something like 10%, and this 10% variation uh, resulted in a vast variation of, uh, of uh, propagation delays. So obviously, electron propagation chronoscopy, uh, uh, as, as this technique might, might be dubbed, uh, uh, turns out to be a very sensitive probe of high energy band structure. More recently, Reinhard Kimberger and uh, uh, co-workers uh, have uh, extended uh, this uh, technique to uh, studying electron transport through atomic layers. They released uh, photoelectrons again by an attosecond pulse and uh, the 4F uh, electrons from the substrate tungsten uh, propagated through an increasing number of uh, magnesium layers put on the surface of this, uh, of this substrate and uh, the propagation time um, uh, has been referenced uh, uh, with respect uh, to that of uh, two p electrons uh, released directly uh, from the topmost uh, magnesium layers. In this way, the propagation difference between these two uh, um, electrons um, um, provided information about the uh, uh, variation of the propagation time of this uh, electron coming from the substrate uh, uh, as a function of the number of add layers. And uh, these uh, this, uh, uh, propagation time differences have, of course, again been measured by uh, attosecond streaking. And uh, this series of attosecond streaking experiments uh, resulted in a uh, monotonic near linear uh, dependence of uh, the electron transport time through these layers uh, with the number of uh, atomic layers um, on the surface of the substrate. So this may not be actually very, very surprising, uh, but the experiment fortunately um, yielded also a much less uh, uh, trivial finding. Uh, uh, I would like to show you in the next minute how uh, this experiment has also provided first time domain or direct insight into, uh, into how uh, abruptly an incident optical field is screened on the surface of a metal. When I'm talking about screening, uh, I'm uh, talking about uh, the normal component uh, of, of the incident field. Um, Unlike the parallel component, which decays uh, um, within a few nanometers, uh, which is known as the skin depth, uh, and this is the prediction of just macroscopic uh, Maxwell equations, the normal component, again, across, ac according to the prediction of Maxwell's equations, uh, changes abruptly on the surface, just right at the surface. It drops to just a few percent of its value above the surface. And now we are in a position to actually ask the question how abrupt this change actually is. Uh, why uh, we are able to do so? 
because these propagation times that we are measuring here, uh, of course, uh, depend on uh, the position where the, this uh, 4F electron starts interacting with the streaking laser field. So if the streaking laser field actually penetrates somewhat deeper, then we expect, and that's what our model calculations show, we expect a decrease in the propagation time uh, because, uh, because uh, the electron reaches the field and, and can start interacting with the field uh, earlier. So now, uh, we can just uh, do this modeling, and here you see the results uh, uh, for different values of the assumed uh, penetration depth, and uh, uh, its comparison with uh, the error bars of our measurement uh, sets a upper limit on this uh, screening depth, uh, which appears to be less than three angstroms, so apparently optical fields, or at least uh, in the near infrared, where uh, uh, these few cycle pulses are being produced. Near infrared optical fields uh, seem to be screened within one single atomic uh, layer of a metal. Um, the next question I would like to address is whether the physical properties of solids uh, can be modified substantially, instantly, and reversibly by the electric field of light. Why we are interested in answering these questions? Because obviously uh, such kind of changes induced uh, by the optical field might uh, provide routes, might uh, uh, show up ways for, uh, for pushing the frontiers of electronic signal processing uh, from gigahertz frequencies towards terahertz and eventually even optical frequencies in the sub petahertz or possibly even petahertz regime. Um, now, where, under which conditions do we or can we expect uh, biggest uh, changes in these physical properties? Obviously, strongest changes uh, are, can be expected under conditions where we can apply strongest field uh, strength, highest field strength. This is possible in wide gap dielectrics uh, um, with few cycle laser pulses, with laser pulses as short as possible. The shorter the laser pulses are, the higher the damage threshold, the higher intensities, the higher electric field strength can be applied uh, reversibly without damage. Uh, what we found and also other groups found uh, that uh, uh, wide gap dielectrics uh, um, under few cycle excitation conditions um, can be exposed to electric field strength exceeding in strength the so-called uh, critical field strength which by definition does work on the electron over the lattice constant that equals uh, the, is equal to the band gap. This critical field strength is about two volt per angstrom in silica. And we asked the question, um, how silica responds uh, to such uh, field strength? Uh, um, and to seek first answers uh, to this question, um, Martin Schulze, uh, Elisabeth Botschafter, in collaboration with uh, quite a few other uh, co-workers in my group, have uh, uh, exposed uh, uh, silica to a few cycle uh, near infrared laser pulse at electric, peak electric field strength uh, close to damage threshold. This is about 2.5, 2.7 volt per angstrom. And uh, studied the uh, dynamic changes in band structure, in high energy band structure, and possibly uh, population changes by attosecond absorption spectroscopy. To this end, a time-delayed uh, attosecond XUV pulse has also been sent into the sample, which promoted electrons from the L shell of silicon to the conduction band. And here you see the um, attosecond uh, uh, transient absorption spectrogram. So this is the uh, 
uh, photon energy range within which uh, we have uh, probed the dynamics. This is this energy here. Uh, and this is the uh, delay between the, uh, between the few cycle needing for an excitation field and the XUB probe pulse. Here you see a line out uh, of this uh, uh, spectrogram near the band edge, which uh, reveals uh, a very substantial near instantaneous and almost fully reversible uh, transient decrease in optical density at these uh, photon energies around, at around 100 electron volts. Uh, which uh, uh, seems to actually oscillate in synchrony with the oscillations of the applied electric field of the few cycle laser excitation. So this behavior um, suggests that um, the dynamics, uh, this electron dynamics that we have created here with the strong field is governed directly by the electric field of this uh, uh, near infrared laser pulse and dominated by changes in band structure rather than um, population dynamics because real population in the conduction band would definitely survive for a long time after this pulse and would prevent this optical density to return to its uh, uh, field-free value right after the excitation. So this actually suggests that here indeed we have a strong response that is instantaneous, that is reversible, so that's indeed what we are after, but we are actually not really mainly interested in what, what is the consequence of this response in this extreme ultraviolet spectral range because it's highly unlikely that uh, future optoelectronics is going to use extreme ultraviolet light for optical signal processing. Most likely we will use uh, visible or infrared light for that purpose. So we would be much more interested in the corresponding nonlinear polarization response of the system at visible and near infrared frequencies. Basically at the same frequencies where we introduce the excitation. And that's exactly uh, what, uh, what we indeed uh, tackled a couple of years ago. So actually this project has uh, been going on for almost three years. Meanwhile, I'm unfortunately in quite a few cases, this is the time scale of an attosecond experiment between two and three years. Um, and I'm happy to summarize uh, for you now the main results of this study, which was again conducted by Martin Schulze this time uh, with uh, Anka Tin Sommer in collaboration also with Hani Fatahi, who is also here in the audience, and uh, Nick Karpovitz. Uh, so what uh, they did here was uh, to send actually f basically the same few cycle laser parts, this time through a somewhat thicker, I, I have, haven't mentioned before, that uh, previous, uh, in the previous experiment the the um, silica sample was extremely thin because, uh, because uh, uh, the XUV pulse uh, uh, was used as a probe, so it had to be thin enough to transmit some XUV light. That's why it was just uh, something like 100 to 200 nanometer thin. In this case, the sample became macroscopic. Uh, it has a thickness of about uh, 10 micrometer, but still thin enough to make dispersion, dispersive effects negligible. So basically the, the few cycle laser pulse, in spite of its tremendous bandwidth, trans, is transmitted through this thin plate without any, disper without any distortion uh, due to dispersion. Now after this transmission, we send this pulse to the street camera, measure the waveform with the method I, I showed you before, and here is the waveform. Now the next step is to shift uh, this plate into the focus and just repeat the measurement. And here you see the result. So this is again uh, the measured waveform. This time uh, it's uh, transmitted at high intensity. And we do see uh, quite some changes. We do see a significant phase shift at the center of the pulse, a positive shift. So the high intensity uh, uh, pulse is 
uh, is, is uh, delayed, uh, the, its phase is delayed uh, on the peak of the pulse, and this phase delay disappears at the end of the pulse, exactly as we expect from the optical care effect. So obviously, we have now time resolved uh, the optical care effect uh, in this experiment. So that's not, not yet really exciting, but it's reassuring that it gives what we expect. To gain a bit uh, more confidence in uh, this, uh, this method, uh, we, we applied it also to a completely different system, to an atomic gas at somewhat higher intensities, so that at the, at the high intensities uh, that we applied, uh, uh, the, uh, the um, atoms, in this particular case uh, neon atoms, uh, have been very substantially ionized. And again, we did uh, this experiment at the two different intensities, basically at the low intensity. This is the ref low intensity reference wave, uh, the, the uh, green curve, and the high intensity wave is the red curve. Now uh, we see a striking difference to the, to the previous experiment here. Uh, the phase shift that the high intensity wave suffers due to the ionizing nonlinear interaction has reversed its sign, right? It's not lagging behind the reference wave as it was before, but the phase is advanced, right? So the, the intense wave is the first. It, uh, the, the phase velocity of uh, uh, the intense wave is apparently in, uh, obviously increased with respect to the reference wave. This is not really surprising if, uh, we, uh, if we consider and accept that most probably the freed electrons dominate the nonlinear response. What else would dominate? I mean, they, they, they can have huge trajectories, so of course they, they provide a major contribution uh, to the polarization response of the, of the system. Uh, which can be much, much bigger than the contribution of the bound electrons. So obviously, uh, uh, free electrons, it makes sense to, to assume that free electrons uh, dominate this response. And we know that free electrons actually introduce a negative contribution to the refractive index. Negative contribution to the refractive index means uh, lowering of the refractive index, speeding up the phase velocity. That's exactly what we see here. And it is also reassuring to see that this, uh, that this uh, speeding up is increasing uh, for, from, from cycle to cycle as the uh, density of electrons is increasing uh, during, uh, during the ionizing uh, laser pulse. So that's, that's very reassuring. Uh, now, uh, what we can also do is just uh, for, from, from these two measurements, from measuring the transmitted uh, high intensity waveform and the low intensity waveform in the limit of low dispersion, where we can assume that none of the two is affected by linear dispersive effects, which is a very good approximation in the current experiment. In this limit, we can actually directly determine from these two waveforms the nonlinear polarization response. That's also quite trivial, actually, or that's, I think, quite intuitive. This difference is purely determined by the nonlinearity because the linear effects are present in both waveforms, right? The linear effects are present both at the low intensity field, the reference wave, the green wave, as well as in the high one. So that cancels out. If there would be only linear effects, both should be the same. But because the high intensity field creates also nonlinear effects, it's not the same. And this difference just provides the direct information about the polarization response. And that's what, what you see here. So that, at first sight, is quite surprising. It looks like the electrons became crazy and they, they, they oscillate basically completely out of phase, creating a polarization that is completely out of phase with the, with the driving laser field. So now let's just, let's just uh, zoom in temporally and, and try to understand how this can emerge. So let's just assume that, uh, or let's just consider when the electrons are actually released. The electrons are obviously released on the peaks of the, of the, of the laser field. So then the electron is released, but when, when do we have the maximum of the polarization? The maximum of the polarization response is at the point where the electron excursion is maximum, right? Because polarization is just charge times displacement from, 
from, from the atom. So when is the excursion maximum? At the point where uh, the laser field managed to completely decelerate the electron, which was, say, released here. That's obviously at the next wave crest, where, where, the, where the electron has been completely decelerated. So that's roughly the point when, when the electron excursion is ma maximum and the electron starts moving back. So that's why we now understand why this is out of phase. So this is the, this is the typical polarization response in a um, ionizing medium where free electrons dominate uh, the nonlinear polarization response. Now let's get back after we have now gained confidence in this new method uh, from these experiments. Let's get back to what we are most interested in, to silica. And um, th let's uh, calculate uh, also here the nonlinear polarization, just as we did before, from the two waveforms, from the high intensity and low intensity reference waveforms. And here you see the result. So in striking contrast to the ionizing medium, here the polarization response is roughly in, um, almost, almost exactly in, in, in phase, almost perfectly in phase with the driving laser field, uh, which uh, uh, clearly sends the message that, uh, that uh, bound electrons are responsible for this polarization response. But if we, if we take a closer look, we actually recognize that there is actually a small delay of, uh, of the nonlinear response. And um, by repeating this measurement at different uh, field strength, we even, even, even recognize a very significant, very substantial dependence of this polarization response time on the uh, electric field strength, on the driving field strength here, for a peak electric field of about two volt per angstrom, which is roughly the critical intensity, we, we measure a response time less than, less than 50 attoseconds, way less than 50 attoseconds actually, uh, whereas uh, this response time increases to something just below 100 attoseconds near the breakdown threshold 2.6 volt per angstrom. That's interesting, but what is perhaps even more interesting, if you take a close look, actually this, this, this delayed response here at the uh, leading edge of the pulse and here at the pulse center actually turns into a, a phase advance, right? That's somehow surprising, isn't it? But we can understand this uh, 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 right now if we consider that or if we recall what, what the consequence of this phase delay is. The consequence of this phase delay is a net energy transfer from the field into the propagation medium. And uh, vice versa, which is governed by this simple equation, but just simply integral, the electric field, the driving electric field times the temporal derivative of the polarization. This integral averages, thank you, averages over the laser cycle to zero if the polarization is exactly in phase with the electric field. And any small phase shift in the one or the other direction uh, makes this integral, also its cycle average value, different from zero. So if there is a polarization delay, then the field starts transferring energy, even averaged over the cycle starts transferring energy to the propagation medium and vice versa. So now, given that we have, we, have, we have measured both the electric field and the nonlinear polarization, we can calculate this temporal, uh, uh, this attosecond varying or, or basically attosecond dynamics of the energy transfer in silica near critical fields. And here you see the results. What is, what is obvious that, uh, that uh, we, have, we have an increase in this, in this transfer up to the pulse peak and slightly beyond, which is somehow understandable because the, high, uh, the field becomes higher and higher, removes the electron farther and farther away uh, from, from, the, uh, uh, from the nucleus. And obviously, the field has to do work in order to, to um, uh, manage to, to achieve this. Whereas, whereas on the trailing edge of the pulse, uh, the field becomes narrow, uh, weaker and weaker. So the electron gradually can return to its, uh, to its field-free position. And when doing so, it uh, returns some of its energy to the field uh, in a process very similar to stimulated emission. But obviously not completely. There is a residual energy here, which, uh, which uh, 
indicates that some real population has been created that survives for a long time and that leads to dissipation. That's what we don't want to have if we, we, we are interested in using this uh, interaction for optical signal processing. Um, what, what, is the, what is the useful part of this interaction of this energy transfer is the reversible part, which is the difference between this maximum and this residual energy. And, and what is conspicuous here is that uh, this difference, the reversible part, uh, is um, much more weakly dependent on the applied electric field strength than the, uh, than the, re the, the irreversible part. So this conveys the message that uh, with a careful adjustment and careful optimization of the, of the electric field strength, we may be able to minimize uh, uh, dissipation, scaling with this, whilst keeping the reversible part that is useful for opticals that can be utilized for optical signal processing at an acceptable level. So that's why, why I hope that uh, this uh, attosecond polarization sampling may be useful by providing insight into the attosecond energy transfer dynamics of light matter interactions may be useful for, for uh, pushing the frontiers of um, uh, signal processing and, and identifying routes for, for um, um, approaching ultimate frontiers. Um, I think I will just uh, skip this and, and, and just uh, maybe if I can have maybe three, three more minutes, just can uh, very quickly uh, through, the, through the last part of my talk, um, advancing our control and insight into electron phenomena obviously requires um, um, a few cycle pulses with larger bandwidth for, for uh, being able to engineer uh, the electric forces of right for improved steering. And uh, uh, we are also interested in much higher peak and average powers for being able to make these forces much stronger. Uh, on the one hand, to produce more powerful attosecond pulses. On the other hand, to produce shorter wavelength attosecond light, both for improved scrutiny. So actually, uh, Eleftherios Gurumakis and uh, his team, uh, um, including uh, Chung Lu, who is, who is also here in the audience, um, have demonstrated in a series of beautiful experiments how at a second uh, engineering of uh, the electric force of light is, is now uh, possible with, uh, with a multi-channel uh, waveform synthesizer uh, by setting it with, with a um, uh, super continuum spanning about two octaves. Um, uh, they also managed to uh, generate uh, uh, um, attosecond optical pulses or sub femtosecond optical pulses uh, consisting basically uh, out of one single half cycle. So this is really spectacular. Uh, however, uh, this, uh, this really spectacular capability of, uh, of, of controlling uh, controlling uh, uh, electric forces uh, uh, on a sub femtosecond time scale unfortunately came at the expense of uh, only moderate field strength uh, uh, simply because the technology is still uh, based on uh, titanium sapphire uh, based systems uh, limited to in the few cycle regime to peak and average power levels of a fraction of a terawatt and several watts respectively. So we believe that advances in attosecond technology demand few cycle light with orders of magnitude, higher peak and average power, and this is only feasible with the new broadband amplification technology. And now, uh, uh, according to our uh, conviction, uh, this uh, new technology um, is likely to be, I know I was too fast, or the computer is too slow, sorry. Somehow there is a big delay here between what I'm seeing here and what's, what's appearing there. Okay. No. Yes, so we believe that uh, this next generation technology is going to be based on broadband optical chirp pulse uh, parametric amplification of visible infrared continua and uh, is going to be driven by uh, sub picosecond deterbium disc lasers uh, that are scalable to sub joule pulse energies and kilowatt average powers. As a matter of fact, uh, we have uh, demonstrated this performance recently in uh, Munich uh, 
uh, both with the, the generation of 100 millijoule pulses at 5 kilohertz at 500 watts of average power as well as 10 millijoule pulses at 100 kilohertz, which corresponds to an average power of 1 kilowatts. Um, Hani Fatahi, who is uh, sitting here, uh, also demonstrated that this technology is not only powerful, but uh, is extremely reliable. As you can see from this uh, long-term operation exhibiting pass-to-pass, short-term pass-to-pass fluctuations below 0.5% and long-term drift uh, over 10 hours, that is less than 1%. So with such a system that is uh, being scaled to 200 mic millijoule uh, at a 5 kilohertz repetition rate, um, according to the calculations and, and uh, 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 design simulations of Hani Fatahi, we uh, uh, f follow this route here to, to, to pump three um, optical uh, parametric amplifier channels in the mid-infrared, near-infrared, and visible, and generate uh, um, several terawatt few cycle pulses in all, uh, at all three wavelength ranges. And if we, uh, uh, if we um, manage to seed these three channels with one and the same uh, a um, couple of octave spanning uh, visible infrared continuums uh, covering the spectral range from 0.5 uh, micron to 2.5 micron, we may be able to coherently combine these three outputs uh, through super octave light transients, uh, the, which, which may result in, in the synthesis of uh, all sorts of waveforms with, with very, very high field strength, um, uh, including actually near one femtosecond pulses with 30 terawatt peak power at a five kilohertz uh, repetition rate. Uh, these uh, these uh, pulses can be optimized uh, for waveforms. This is again, just one minute and I'm done. Thank you. Uh, uh, was done again by Hani Fatahi and uh, Marcelo Chiapina, this uh, simulation, which have showed that optimized waveforms may be able to substantially extend uh, at the second technology uh, from the current 100, 200 electron volt photon energy range towards uh, kilo electron photon energies and uh, um, afford promise for uh, generating uh, five angstrom scale isolate, isolated um, uh, pulses with pulse durations uh, in the 10 femtosecond regime, which uh, might open the prospect for imaging atomic scale electron dynamics by at a second extreme diffraction. So I hope I've been able to show you or to convince you that these synthesized multi-octave optical fields and at a second X-ray pulses are likely to revolutionize uh, at a second science and hold promise for observing in real time all motions, in, including both electronic and structural, in complex systems such as biological molecules and solids and uh, exploring the ultimate speed limit of signal metrology as well as processing, uh, as well as identifying viable routes to approaching this limit. So I, I um, think um, there is really uh, plenty of reasons uh, to look forward to exciting new discoveries in attosecond science, given that uh, uh, there is uh, plenty, of roof, uh, plenty of room for exciting uh, discoveries at the bottom. Thank you for your attention. We'll take time for a question or two, and then there'll be copy break. So the slide went by a bit too quick, so I didn't quite follow you. On one point where uh, you had uh, the nonlinear polarization measurement uh, for silica, the question was, uh, the question is that uh, the absorption did it, uh, seemed a bit large. Is it, do you open up new channels of, of absorption, or just it was just purely uh, uh, linear absorption, the reversible, non-reversible part? Uh, what do you mean by absorb? You are talking about this, I guess? Uh, no, not that. The other one uh, after this, when you showed... Uh, oh, here. Okay. Uh, right, right. Mm -hmm. so, so say it again. So the question was that uh, the change in uh, non-reversible part. Yes. Right. Uh, so does it, was it scaling just linearly or...? No, obviously not. That's, no, obviously that was the not. point, right. right so right. thanks for the question. So it it's scales very, very strongly non-linearly which is not very surprising if you, if you relate this residual uh, uh, energy density that remains in the system after the laser pulse. Obviously, this relates to real population in the conduction band. This real population can, given the low photon energy as compared to the band gap, can only emerge due to some multi-photon transitions, right? So that's why it's not really surprising that this scales so 
incredibly rapidly with, with the electric field strength. And this is good because this means by a slight decrease of the electric field, uh, maybe from the breakdown threshold, which anyway is good not to work very close to breakdown threshold, uh, already helps us uh, to reduce the dissipation tremendously. Whilst, whilst the reversible part, which is responsible for, for the effects that we may be able to utilize for signal processing, is still uh, very comparable. Thank you. Thank you very much, friends, for a fantastic talk. Uh, Thank you. In your uh, study of nonlinear uh, process, in fact, following out that question, but for the ionizing case, right. what was the ex extension of your excursion path for the electrons? How far the electrons go up and oh, down? Oh, that's a good point. Uh, well, I can only guess. I, I think it's on the order of uh, 5 to 10 nanometers. So if that's the case, what would happen if instead of having a f uniform plate, you actually put a bunch of nanowires? with the orientation normal to the electric field. So that can interrupt, actually, the uh, path of the electron. That can lead to huge nonlinearity. I agree. Would be, would be exciting to look at that. Thank you. Great. Mm -hmm.